Gary Hoff, AppSec Training, securing the SDLC, webgo.net. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys ready? You guys ready to talk about AppSec? Yeah. All right, me too. I don't think I need a microphone. Are you guys telling me you okay? Need a oh, you need a microphone. For this. All right, let me uh, use the microphone. <laughs> Testing. Testing. Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. All right, sounds good. Well, everybody, welcome to AppSec Training, Securing the SDLC, WebGo.net, and the Meaning of Life. So in this talk, or in this talk, what we're gonna do is go through these topics, but specifically what I'm gonna focus on is this. Most organizations are finally now realizing they need security training. They've got a lot of developers, a lot of things going on. They're, they're, they're potentially dependent on external resources for training. So what I would say is you've got to be doing this internally. And training doesn't just need to be, all right, we want a three-day class, we want a two-day class. It's an ongoing process. So what I'm going to be discussing is what you need to be doing internally, talk about the way that you need to present the data based on my experiences. Um, we're going to be going through a, a sample application that I put together called webgoat.net, which I believe is a good vehicle to demonstrate these things, which is freely available. And of course, the meaning of life. So let's get to the meaning of life first. 42. 42, you got it, all right, let's move on. <laughs> so for this class, or for the, I keep saying class, excuse me, for this lecture, this is what I think the meaning of life is. That's easy, That's easy right, yeah, exactly. I know we have a couple Greek speakers in the house, but essentially this is a quote from Socrates, who said, really, the only sin is ignorance, and the only, the only, um, what is it, I have it down here, and the, and the only virtue is knowledge. And I'm a firm believer in this. That's absolutely what I believe. And this is where our, our AppSec problems come from. It's just simply, it's not any big deal. Application security is really just ignorance of all the different uh, vulnerabilities and all the secure coding and uh, defense, defensive controls that need to be in place. Would everybody pretty much agree with that? Uh, hopefully. I mean, for the most part, we write code, we can fix the code, but if the, if the developers have the right knowledge, these vulnerabilities will never even appear to begin with. That's my hypothesis for this talk. So who, who am I? Again, my name is Jerry Hoff. I currently work at White Hat Security. I'm the VP of the Static Code Analysis Division. Now, I hate when people kind of sit there and they read out their whole resume, blah, blah, blah. The only things that are important for this particular talk is that I do a lot of work with OWASP. I have a tutorial series which has gotten up maybe 125,000 views in Bruce County, right? So it's got, uh, it, it's quite a, a, quite an outreach effort, right? I mean, 120,000 views for a cat video, nothing, right? But for application security, it's not bad. <laughs> um, I also do webgo.net, which we're gonna talk about as well. I used to be a consultant, uh, done reviews on all sorts of web applications throughout you know, financial district, throughout the financial world. Uh, I used to be a full-time employee at Morgan Stanley. I was on their global security architecture team. And for this talk, just so I have a little bit of credibility here, I, I taught at Washington University's Kate program, which was this adult education program. It was primarily where we would have people coming in from Boeing, Monsanto, Anheuser-Busch, the large organizations, large companies that were in that area. And we would do training. And I did this for eight years. 40 hours a week, so I, I've logged over 10,000 public speaking hours, right? So that's a lot of training. I've trained a lot of people. I've trained in the thousands of engineers on how to code, um, not just how to code securely, but just how to code in general and then how to code securely. And there's definitely a lot of lessons that I learned. And there's a lot of tricks of the trade uh, in, as far as informing adults. So we're gonna go through that. So who are you guys? I'm hoping that what you, you're either probably somebody who wants to build an internal training program, or maybe you do training, right? And you wanna know, okay, what does this guy have to say as far as what can help me out in my training? Um, or you're uh, potentially in an organization and you're thinking about, do we really need training? Because this has come up recently. Some people are like, you know what? Developer training, forget about it. It's not necessary, it's not really needed. I would strongly disagree with that statement. Right? And I would actually say that developer training, if properly done, can eliminate a lot of the issues that we see. 
So why AppSec training? Is this necessary? What, what's your gut feeling tell you? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, that's my gut feeling too. <laughs> so the, um, yeah, I mean, look at the news. We, get, we see it all the time, right? You've got all of these groups basically just using the entire web as their playground because there are almost every web application that exists has these major vulnerabilities. Right? Now it's interesting because I've been teaching these classes for years and developers would say to me, Jerry, you know, if this was such a big issue, why is this not in the news? Well, they never say that anymore because it's in the news every single day, right? And who brought it to the forefront of everybody's attention? Anonymous, right? Kind of an interesting group of guys. Did you guys go to the, you know, two years ago at DEF CON, they did a kind of a press conference. It's kind of interesting. Got to chill out with those guys for a little while. Um, very interesting group of people, right? Um, but we all agree now that security training is fundamental. It's a fundamental building block. If your developers are writing code, but yet they don't know how to code securely, what fighting chance do they have? Okay. Now, there's a couple of training pillars that I want to get kind of, let's just get to the meat of the issue. If you are devising, if you are architecting, or if you are delivering application security, there are certain key things that you gotta keep in mind. So the first one is the presentation itself. So I've seen a lot of people, especially in the security community, where they give these demonstrations, and they, I don't think they mean to do it, but in, inadvertently, they almost make a mockery of the people that they're teaching, right? They kind of say, oh, you know, developers do this and that, ha, 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 we can, you know, we can exploit it this way. It's not really effective to make fun of your audience, right? You don't, you don't, I mean, it depends, right? Some people are into that. But for the most part, that's not how you want to deliver this information. This information needs to be delivered in a very gentle way. These, when you're talking to developers, these are professionals that even though, yeah, we find security vulnerabilities, they build highly scalable, very effective, uh, 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 applications, right? Yeah, there's a couple things that they overlook from a security perspective because they don't study the security, right? So sitting there kind of making fun of them and so forth, it's not exactly the way you want to do it. I'm not saying everybody does that, but I've seen it enough that I thought it should warrant some kind of attention, okay? Um, I'd also say keep it relevant. I see a lot of, I was at a Jazoon conference a while back, which is in Switzerland. It's not a security conference, it's a Java conference. And there was a security talk. So I went in naturally, sat down. And these guys were kind of up, up at the stage and they were kind of mumbling and they were in the back and you know, they were doing some XSS exploits and then you saw, like, you saw like some alert boxes pop up. And then I was in the crowd and I heard people saying, I don't understand how the alert box is gonna you know, hurt us, right? So they were just basically looking at the sample exploit but it not, had not been made relevant for those people. Because just going up there, we know that if you're gonna show a cross site scripting flaw, you do a little alert box or whatever, it's shorthand, but most people don't know that. You need to make it relevant, you need to link it to their organization, you need to link it to their code, and you need to link it to what they do on a daily basis. Drive it home for these people. One thing that I also do is I ask my students, wear two hats. You're in here not as a developer alone, but every single one of us also uses the internet, right? So. If you use email, you use online banking, if you use whatever, that's all stuff that you can also say, hey, look, you know, these, are, these, are, these particular issues would affect you not only as a developer, but also as a user. So you need to always make sure that you keep this information relevant. And also, if you have sample applications, and this is like a little foreshadowing of things to come, these applications should somewhat be relevant to the people and you should have real world examples that you display uh, in the class. And then, of course, this is one thing that I always tell people. If you're, if you're in the market to buy training, if you're providing training, whatever it is, you have to focus on the defense. You can't just do a little bug parade and say cross-site scripting, SQL injection, access control, authentication, improper crypto, direct object reference. You can do that all day, and what are you really doing? You're, you're destroying the developer's confidence, right? You're making them scared, and they're like, oh my god, every single line of code I've ever written sucks, and then they run out, and they don't want to hear you anymore. You've, you've got to focus on empowering these people. You have to focus on the defensive, uh, uh, focus on the security defenses, right? What are the security controls that come standard with your platform? Let's talk about that. How do you use these things, right? Focus on the defense. The, the, the attacks, even though they're way more fun to talk about, should just be a backdrop. And I do think that we focus way too much on attacks. 
If you go look at Amazon and you start looking at all the books in security, 90% of them are what? Attacks. Right? Nobody wants to buy a book on defense. They want to buy a book on attacks. But that's why we're in the situation we're in. Right? So you need to focus on defense. And if you're looking for a good book topic to write about, I would suggest defensive programming. There's a complete dearth of these books. Right? Defensive programming and PHP would probably be a bestseller. Right? Hopefully, hopefully, you market it right, you know, attacks and defense. I don't know, something like that. You've got to like, work it in. But we obviously need this kind of instruction out there. So that's my basic pillars. If you give up and you're actually giving these kinds of talks, that's what I would suggest. Now, where does this thing, whole thing fit in into a company's SDLC? So this next part of the talk I want to get into, again, I don't have much time, but the next part I want to get into is essentially building a case. So some of you in this audience, not all of you, but some of you are going to have to go to the guys that have the checkbooks and say, hey, I need to build a case for this, right? How do you convince the people who have the money, write me a check for however many, you know, however much money it's going to be to give our developers training? Because it ain't cheap, right? If you go out there and you find good trainers, it ain't cheap. So how do you build this case? First of all, I would, when I worked in corporations, when I worked in large enterprises, you have to give some kind of basis for what you're saying. You guys already know this. You don't just go and say, I think we need developer training because of whatever reason, you've got to build some kind of a case based on other studies and everything else. So we're going to go through that. But if you're looking for training, here's what I would suggest. If you can afford it, get live hands-on training. By hands-on, meaning people are just like here, we're just, I'm talking at you. That will work for 45 minutes. That ain't going to work for eight hours, right? The developers need to get their hands dirty. They need to be on, they need to be coding. They need to be doing the exploit and they need to be fixing it. Right? So that kind of training, that goes a long way, especially the fixes. So training is not just about talking, talking, talking. As you know, you need to absorb this stuff. So having them sit down and actually write out, you know, solve cross-site scripting, and then put it in all sorts of tricky ways so that they can, they've solved it all the different ways they're going to see in the real world. Right? Has anybody in here ever like, written code to defeat DOM-based XSS? It's non-trivial. Right? Having them do this. You know, when, when they've got a, a pending deadline, is asking for failure. Giving them a safe environment within a classroom to actually figure this out, ask questions, and whatever, that's how security needs to be done. Right? Sound good to everybody? Web specific languages, obviously, big plus. So, how do you build a case for this? Are there other experts out there besides vendors who say training is important? Because a vendor will tell you training is important because they're selling you training, right? But are there any kind of independent like, places we can go to get this information? Are you guys familiar with these four um, documents? Good. Some yes, some no's, probably some no's. So let's go through them very, very briefly. First of all, this NIST document, you'd be familiar with this if you do government work, right? This is what NIST says you need to have as far as your SDLC. This is how you build secure software according to the government. And one of the key takeaways that they have training, security controls, and verification of security controls. It makes sense, right? You give training, you tell the training is specific to the security controls, and then you go through and you verify that they actually use those security controls. Would that wind up in more secure software? I think so. All right, Microsoft, very well known for secure software. I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> Microsoft. They have this simplified SDL, this simplified secure development life cycle, right? What are their takeaways? Training is at the beginning of everything else. So just like they were saying before, developers who are working on web applications or applications in general should have gone through some kind of a training class. I totally agree with that. They have a very interesting study. If, if you're going to read this, by the way, read the simplified version, you know, at least to begin with. The other version is like, uh, put me to sleep. But the simplified version is very readable, very legible. And they break it down into a couple core key, key things. Training, security requirements, that should, be let it, you know, that should be factored into the training. Threat modeling, that should be in the training as well. Static analysis, to make sure that they're actually going through and they're putting in the security controls that you train them to do. And if, if one is missing, they at least know what you're talking about because they've had the training. And then you know, dynamic analysis and final security review, right? That's what they say an SDLC is. And if you notice, everything kind of stems out of the training for the most part. 
Uh, so these are the takeaways. Training, static, dynamic. Okay. Uh, does that mean that they're perfect in security? Uh, no. You know, you had um, Windows 7, the first week it came out, supposed to be like, you know, after Microsoft has been doing their secure development for 10 years, it's like zero day on the first day, right? Anybody can make mistakes. The point is, how many zero days did they avoid, right, with this kind of uh, methodology? All right, you guys are all familiar with this one, right? This is an OWASP project. This is OpenSAM. This is a fantastic document. Um, by the way, before we go any further, all of these documents, though, are always going to be basically just frameworks. You can't take any of these and follow them to the T because they're not relevant always to your organization. Right? You have to take these, kind of take the best of, and then, uh, and then decide, okay, in my organization, we need to do this, this, and this. But I'm, you know, I'm pointing out that every single one of these documents, training is you know, pretty key. Training, validation, review. Pretty much the same basic stuff, same basic stuff, same basic stuff. You train them how to do it, you validate that they did it, you know, and then you have continuous reviews that no other security uh, uh, problems have crept in. All right, so last but not least, BSIM. What is BSIM? BSIM is not any kind of SDLC <coughs> study. What is BSIM? Anybody know? At least somebody. I'll tell you. BSIM is a study that they went to all these organizations and said, what are you doing? That's all they asked. What are you doing? Now, Tiger Woods wears Nike. Does that mean if I wear Nike, I'm gonna be a better golfer? No, causation, you know, correlation does not equal causation. And the same thing has to, be, has to be thought of when you're reading this document. But guess what? When they go through and they find out what all organizations are doing, all these major organizations they, that they talk to, they're doing awareness training, they're doing a security review with automated tools, and they're doing external pen testing. Right? So these are kind of, they're doing a whole bunch of stuff. There's 15, but those are the core things for this talk. Sound reasonable to everybody? Have I built somewhat of a case? Is there anybody in this room that's saying, you know what, Jerry, I still think training sucks? All right, hopefully not. I've had that before happen. I've had people in the class saying, training just doesn't work. Granted, those were people working in companies that were starting to sell solutions to security that didn't involve training, but you know, there's always those naysayers out there. All right, so that's the takeaway from uh, BSIM. So that's your homework for tonight. Read those documents. <laughs> if you haven't already done it, download these guys. They're all freely available. Grab them. And that it's really just good. Any security practitioner, I don't care what level you're at, you should have some type of mental map as to what an entire security program looks like. And some of you are thinking, Jerry, don't tell me. I do this all day. I know. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the people who haven't read these documents. So wrap your brain around them. All right, so I'm hoping there's some agreement at this point. So what does OWASP have to offer in the realm of security and the realm of education? A lot, right? A lot. Um, there have been training classes here. Right? We were doing training classes yesterday and the day before. I know that Owen and Germanico were doing free training classes. Those are phenomenal if you can get your developers out there. I've started an initiative where I, like I told you before, I, I spent a lot of time building like pretty polished, animated music, this and that, um, videos to try to help people. Just because it was frustrating for me to explain cross-site scripting for the 10 millionth time. I'm like, I am tired of explaining this. I'm going to make an animated video that is so simple, you know, you can put it on Sesame Street and it will be indistinguishable from their normal cartoons, right? <laughs> it's very simple. And I get, I get calls from, CE, uh, from CIOs and CISOs and they're like, I never really got it. Right? I never, people always say XSS or SQL injection or whatever. I never really got it. Now I get it. So. Couple tools at your disposal. Number one, that video series. Very easy to find. Go to owasp.org. It's right there on the main page, right? Can't miss it. If you also go to YouTube, you type owasp, you will see a whole bunch of links of videos. I just put out a new one on HTTP strict transport security. So I'm starting to give not only just the basic topics, but kind of new topics. And then ultimately, I'm going to branch out into owasp projects. So if you have an owasp project, and you're thinking, I'd like it if Jerry kind of promoted this product, this project. I will do that. Let me know. There's already a, lot, a line of people who want this. The next video that's coming out is on Zap, 
by the way. You guys all use Zap? Cool. So that's the next one. Um, so again, just go to OWASP. I'm sorry, just type in OWASP. You'll see these videos. This is kind of old at the time, 104. It's now up to like 120, 130, something like that. And again, this is what the videos kind of look like. I think it's playing, isn't it? Yeah. So again, highly polished, lots of animation, makes it very simple, etc. So take a look. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like. like again, it's, it's so straightforward that it's impossible to, to not understand. And so I have actually a lot of banks that have called me and said, we're now using these videos in our internal training programs. So all new developers, they at least got to know SQL injection, cross site scripting. They've got these videos. So they call me up, they say, can you give us high def versions of these so we can put them online and stuff like that? Like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's what's going on. WebGoat. You guys use WebGoat in internal training? WebGoat is awesome. WebGoat is awesome. A little bit dated on the Java side. A little bit dated because it's just pure, you know, just, just pure JSPs and servlets, but it gets the point across. And it's, 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 it's venerable, not vulnerable. It is that too. But it's, it's venerable. It's, it's, you know, battle tested. People use it all over. I use it in training classes when I'm teaching Java. So if you're thinking, if you're in the, in the, in the audience thinking, yeah, what applications am I going to use to demonstrate? For Java classes, WebGoat is great. It's also good for self-study. I know a lot of people told me, hey, I came into security because I went through WebGoat. So let's get to the project of the hour, webgoat.net. .net always feels like the red-headed stepchild of OWASP. I don't know why, but webgoat, I'm sorry, .net always seems like everything is Java, 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 .net, right? I don't know why. I mean, it's... A lot of people are using it. It's got a lot of built-in security controls. When you actually look at .NET, it does a lot. I mean, they do a lot of best practices, right? They include, not the world's best built-in authentication, but it exists, right? They have multiple ways of doing authentication. They've got multiple ways of doing access control built in. They've got anti-XSS features built in. They've got anti-CSRF features built in. I mean, they're doing it right for the most part, right? If you use Link, you're, you're preventing a lot of SQL injection. So there's a lot of things that they do that are kind of right out of the box that help developers build secure code. So maybe that's why. Maybe there's more problems with Java. I don't know. No, uh, I'm obviously a .NET person, right? So, um, so this is what webgoat.net looks like. Now, when I was sitting down to think how this was going to work, I, um, I didn't want to just copy webgoat. Webgoat is great, but when I would teach classes, a lot of the times, Developers had a hard time relating the lessons I was doing with the real world. Like some of the lessons inside of WebGoat are a little bit like, like the have you, you guys know the reflected XSS? It's like the tax field. It just is not really that real world-ish, right? So I tried to do a couple things here differently. Number one, in WebGoat.net, you can see, and again, this is not as well filled out as WebGoat. But you can see that there's all those, just like the same way, there's the lessons that go down. And you can click on cross-site scripting. There's a bunch of cross-site scripting. You can click on authentication and encryption and injection attacks. So you can do that kind of work-along thing where you're going through step by step. But then there's also an entire built-in web application that's not a lesson. It's just a web application. It's an e-commerce web app inside of here so that if you can't get across, like people always need to see something like in two different aspects to really get their brain around it. So you can show them one, and then you can kind of show them in the real world example within the built-in web app. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's what I tried to do. I tried to make it so that you could just stick in one web application and then show the same vulnerability multiple places. And then when you kind of see it in context, all of a sudden it does click a little bit. Like I go to classes, and I'm like, have you guys ever seen a web application that uploads files? And everybody's like, no. I'm like, what? No, I've never seen that. Come on, you've got to you see this. Then I show it in context, like, oh, yeah, OK, that makes sense. You upload files. I'm like, OK. Right? So I don't know why. <laughs> That's the way it is. So I kept jumping. I used to jump out, in and out, in and out of like multiple web apps. I try to now kind of bring it all home so it's inside of one. So That's one kind of feature. I also try to make it a little bit easier to set up. So when I would teach classes and like everybody's like, oh, I can't get this configured. And I had to go around the room and waste 30 minutes or whatever. It's horrible. So we, we try to go in here and put. Um, a little bit more wizardry so that you can just say, hey, this is my database, this is this and that. By the way, a couple guys in here who also work on this project, right here in the front row, you got Ray and Harry. These guys have done a phenomenal job. The, the, update, um, the user interface is actually a little bit more updated now. 
So Harry actually edited um, multiple uh, types of databases you can use, like MySQL, SQL Server, um, SQL Lite. Right? So it just makes it more flexible as a training tool. And one, one more thing I should mention as well, this thing is kind of bizarre. It's written in .NET, but it's cross-platform. So we, we wrote it according to Mono. So you can throw it into a Linux distro, hint, hint, right? You can, uh, <laughs> right? So it, it totally works under Linux distro. It totally works under OS X, um, et cetera. So this thing, it's, it's cross-platform. You can throw it into a free training tool. It can be on the same CD as WebGoat, whatever else, and you're good to go. And this is the built-in web application that I talked to you about. And then these are like the lessons. You can go through and like do all these different lessons from injection. Again, these slides are like now six months old. There's many more lessons. So let's jump into it very quickly in the time I have remaining. 20 minutes, cool. Let's do a quick demo. And this demo is not to, let's turn this off. This demo is not to like, I mean, if you're a security person, you're not going to walk out saying, oh, I, you just taught me something I didn't know. I mean, of course you know. But, shoot. But this demo um, is to kind of show you how I would go through the class. And this is like how I would do it. All right. So webgo.net. It also works under, um, what is that clone, that Linux clone of, of Visual Studio? Sharp Develop? Mono Develop. It works fully under Mono Develop. Actually, the first version that I put out, I developed it exclusively under Linux, and then it didn't even work under Windows. It's really embarrassing to have a .NET application that like, doesn't work under a Microsoft operating system. So like Dennis Cruz is like, Jared, I can't get this to work. I'm like, well, sorry, dude. Like, I'll go back and fix it. So this one, though, fully has been tested. It works. So let's bring this sucker up. Now, the database by default that it uses, again, because I was doing it under Linux, whatever, it's uh, MySQL. I didn't want to depend on proprietary software. So is that going to be a problem? Hopefully not, but it's MySQL. And then we will add support. I mean, there's support for these other databases. But Actually, I gave the same lecture a while back in Colorado. Some guy came up to me at the end and said, you know, it's a really cool project, but you're not going to get very far with these databases that nobody's ever heard of. <laughs> MySQL? It's like, yeah, dude, I've never heard of that. <laughs> All right, you're d definitely .NET, you know, pure blood .NET, right? Like, you never heard of MySQL, so hopefully everybody in here knows that MySQL is actually the most popular database, I think, in the world, right? Open source, it's fully, you know, functional, it's, you know, whatever, it's owned by Oracle, so there's a little bit of conflict of interest, so maybe it's gonna have to su support Postgres and other databases as time goes on. This is an open source tool. You can do whatever you want with it. We're gonna keep though adding the features that we think should be in there. So like I said, there's a little, there's a little um, wizard. You can go into the wizard. You can pick what kind of database that you're using. These fields, we're gonna make this wizard a little bit more wizardy so that depending on what you pick, it'll kind of give you like, you know, a little gamification, popping, things popping up saying, you know, do this or do that, whatever. You can actually test the configuration, make sure that it works, connection to the database successful. That now gives you access to this sample web application and then the inject all the different lessons, et cetera. All right, so we need to put more lessons in there. We would love to have more volunteers. There's only three of us right now, so let me know. Uh, but this is the way that I try to explain this stuff. And this is how I would explain it even, sometimes you've gotta make a case even to non-technical people, right? So this kind of, these kind of tools can be used in those situations as well. So this is you know, one way to maybe go about doing it. Trying to explain to somebody how SQL injection works. All very simple to us, not simple to everybody, right? First thing I might show is, okay, you go to a customer ID field, you know, you put in a special character, like a single quote, find email, and the error message pops up, and it's kind of hard to see. Hang on. Uh, no, 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 no. Here's my OS 10 shortcut, it didn't work here. Anyway, what it says here is, you're, you have an error in your MySQL server. So what, that already tells the attacker that you're using MySQL, which is important to know, and that because this error message is actually saying, you have a syntax error near line one at the single quote, now all of a sudden I know that my single quote character 
actually was tried to, it was interpreted by the, um, by the SQL interpreter, right? That's the definition of SQL injection. I'm able to inject my own control characters and then gain control of this thing. So that's kind of like lesson, the little first little bit of this. So now the question is, all right, how do you actually exploit this? Yes, we've determined there's SQL injection. How would you actually exploit it? Well, I would explain to people, yeah, maybe you have a blind SQL injection. The first thing you need to now know is what are your range of options? What are all the things you can do with this database, right? Does a database contain certain meta tables and metadata that we can use to extract out so the attacker can find out more? Absolutely. Anybody happen to know what that is in, in MySQL? Well, asterisk percent, right? But what I'm saying is meta tables. Are there tables that describe the tables? Can I find out the structure of the database through a SQL injection flaw? Hint, yes. Yeah, the answer is yes. I was kind of hoping you guys would know because I forgot. But um, <laughs> fortunately, I do have a script. So take a look here. And it's kind of hard to see. But basically right here, select table schema, table name, column name from information schema dot columns. What does that do? Let's put it up one more time real quickly. Notepad. Notepad. No, I am here. For somebody like myself who doesn't have great vision, this is not suitable. Boom. All right. So I like to do this because this gives people a sense of what a real attack looks like. Because I, I, sometimes developers just like, I get, or they go, I know there's a SQL injection flaw here, but I don't see how it could be exploitable. They can't see the tables. They don't know what's going on. You kind of have to walk through this thing step by step, right? So this is like Mary, single quote. So like you fill in the field. And then union selects table schema, table name, column name from information schema dot column. What's the pound sign in this case? The comment, because you don't know where in the heck in the SQL statement you are. So now you're saying just ignore all the rest of the dangling garbage. So let's try this out. I have a feeling it's going to work. <laughs> the other thing to mention, by the way, at this point is that attacking is never this, this simple. It's never a one-step process. This is the other thing you can neutralize people's questions when they're like, well, yeah, but unless they specifically know that, they're not going to try it. I'm like, no. These people are going to sit there and try it, right? That is what I, that's why you always envision them at, at home in the basement up until 7 in the morning surrounded by Mountain Dew cans. <laughs> because they try things. They don't just do it once. right? I don't know. People have this mental block that if like, they don't know, they're not going to try. So we've got all this great information now. We unioned on all the metadata from the database onto the normal <laughs> output. right? So you've got one field up at the top, which is Mary. And then you've got, you unioned on all the rest of this stuff. Now, usually, if people don't know about this attack, this is where you start seeing like a little pale in the face, a little widening of the eyes, a little dilation of the pupils, because they're like, oh, wow, I had no idea. Right? This, is, this is not good. So then you might scroll up and down and show the different fields here. And what, what are the goodies that we want to get out of this thing? Yeah. Emails, passwords, security questions. These are juicy, right? By the way, I always, it's always interesting. What's that? Yeah, credit card numbers. I mean, every, everything we want, right? So let's just grab some of them out. Let's grab email and password, and we'll get like whatever this answer is, just for the fun of it, right? So I just happen to have that at my disposal. Same thing, now that we have the metadata of the field, I mean of the database, we can go back up here again, paste it in, find employees, there we go. Email addresses, and this is where there'll be a naysayer in the class. The naysayer will say, aha, it's encrypted, foiled, right? We're safe. This is a good opportunity, by the way, to describe now, this is how encryption, you know, encryption versus encoding, and Clearly, when you're looking at this guy, you can probably say, wait a minute, 
Hang on, upper lower letters and numbers, equal signs at the end for the padding. I think this might be base 64, right? Let's give this guy a spin. <laughs> so we'll just select one at random. We will open up, just pull up zap. Zap, 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 zap. Cool. Simon Bennett, if you're watching, zap, right? We talk on a daily basis. He's the guy who does Zap. So uh, good friend of mine. We will do, is, is it up there? Yeah, encode, decode, hash. Boom, decode. The password is rainbow. That's it, right? So you could have actually done it in a SQL query because MySQL has an ability to decode base64. So if you really wanted to do it, you can do it. I kind of like more steps because then they're like, oh, now you use multiple tools. And they're like, oh, we're hackers now. And, you know, then they really get into the class, right? So you're showing them these various tools that they can use. So that's how I would do, you know, th that's how I usually go about the class. And again, this tool is open source. Everything I just did, all open source. You can do the same thing in your internal training.